Uh, my name is David Millichap. I'll be chairing uh, this morning's meeting. It's our first Queensland Primary Healthcare Network meeting for 2021. We hold four of these a year and different topics each time. And, and obviously today is around growing your own health workforce. So we've got several speakers um, today, some case studies. So really looking forward uh, to the morning. Uh, to commence the meeting, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm located today, that being the Turrbal and the Yuggera people in Brisbane, but also conscious of the fact we've got people from around the state here today. So acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of the land uh, where you're located as well. As I said, lots of, lots of speakers to get through. You do have the opportunity through the Q&A panel to type a question at any time this morning and uh, we'll get to those just during during um, the sessions. The panellists can see your questions, other, other participants can't. So feel free to um, ask a question at any time and we'll keep an eye on the Q&A uh, panel. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers one by one as, as they talk. Um, just a little context setting first from me. Um, I do have some notes here, so excuse me if I do refer to those. Um, but as you probably know, um, the health industry is one of the largest uh, creators of new jobs in Queensland, and it's projected to do be so over the next five years. But while um, jobs are growing, the demand is also growing rapidly for health service delivery. And at the moment, and projections are showing that the workforce jobs aren't keeping pace with the health service delivery demands across the state. And as you know, when supply uh, and demand don't meet, we end up with uh, shortages. So having a strong, sustainable and resilient workforce uh, is at the core of Queensland's health system. And that's really been high highlighted during the COVID pan pandemic. And also the health workforce plays a really critical role in our regions um, for the health and well-being of local communities, but also the economic prosperity of regions as well. So it's clear, pretty clear that health service providers need to adopt smarter, more contemporary and innovative workforce planning models uh, to, to meet this demand. Uh, we need to invest in our local communities and providing Queenslanders with training, education, employment opportunities, and particularly now we're focusing on school leavers, displaced workers, and also those experiencing disadvantage. Uh, so as I say, this morning you'll hear from several speakers who are working really hard to implement such models around the grow your own health workforce. Uh, but before we kick off with those projects, we'd be good to hear a little bit more about some of the data behind these and what's driving workforce planning. And so we're delighted uh, to have Shaz Gurko from Jobs Queensland as our first speaker today. This is actually the third time we've had Shaz present data at various meetings held by Checkup. So we keep getting you back Shaz because it's really interesting data and really informs a lot of the work we're doing. So thanks so much for agreeing to come back again and I'll hand over to you now. Shaz won't have her um, camera on uh, because of connectivity issues but hopefully you can see her slides. Thanks, Shaz. Thanks very much, David. Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me along again. Um, as David said, I'm actually the Research and Data Officer for Jobs Queensland, and some of you may not know what Jobs Queensland is. Um, and it looks like some of you are going to know. My slide's not moving on. Hold on a minute. Oh, there we go. So, Jobs Queensland. Uh, Jobs Queensland is a fairly new organisation. We were in, we were in, uh, established, I guess, in 2016 um, as a, a body, a statutory entity and an independent statutory entity, which is um, governed by a board which is comprised of uh, workforce planning uh, experts, industry, um, and also representatives. Um, and our key uh, priorities are to provide advice to the government and to the minister um, for training and skills in particular around three main areas. And so those areas are on, on the screen, hopefully they're now. So obviously future skills needs. Uh, we also look at workforce planning and development and we also provide advice around the apprenticeship and traineeship system. And one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves, I guess, um, is that we engage heavily within regions and industry uh, and other sectors of the community to make sure that we're actually providing up-to-date um, and informed advice. 
uh, to the government on, on especially on those skills that are needed into the future. And the information I'm going to show you today comes from um, our main uh, series, I guess, which is called Anticipating Future Skills. Um, and I will talk about that a bit in the minute, uh, a bit about that a bit in a minute. I'm sorry about that. Um, but what I did want to talk about now is just give you a little bit of an overview of what's happened to the labour market um, since COVID has uh, hit. I'm just having trouble moving my screen on. There we go. So this is the, the latest uh, data that we have from the ABS. There is a new set coming out um, on Thursday. So this came out last week. This is the headline stats. So this is Queensland at the moment. That table on the left-hand side um, shows you what happened between December and January. So we can see that uh, there is a bit of a recovery and you can kind of see that in that chart to the right, which shows you the number of people employed. Obviously, there was a big fall in the number of people employed in Queensland from around March 2020, but you can see that that recovery is underway and we actually increased employment in Queensland by about 0.1% between December 2020 and January this year. Um, unfortunately, we've still got around 194,000 people unemployed in Queensland, but we have seen that uh, fall over the month by around 7%, which means that our unemployment rate is down to 7%, which is still much higher than we would like. And unfortunately, we anticipate that it will remain elevated for a while to come. Um, one of the things around the, the recovery of employment is that the growth in Queensland has been almost all in part-time employment. So one of the concerns for, for people, I guess, is that there will be a bit of an increase in underemployment or people seeking um, extra hours. And so we can see that the underemployment rate increased a little bit over the months to 8.6%. Um, I thought I'd draw your attention also to the chart on the right-hand bottom side, which is actually uh, showing the number of people who are unemployed in Queensland by uh, sex. There's been a lot of talk nationally around the fact that um, employment for females was uh, most affected. And while this might have been, been the case kind of earlier on nationally, um, you can see here, this is going back from 2016, the, the dark green line is the number of unemployed females and that lighter green line is the number of unemployed males. And we really haven't seen that issue in Queensland and that I would suspect is because we have a, a kind of different industry composition in this state to some of the others. And as you can see, um, number of unemployed for both males and females is starting to, to uh, trend downwards there, which is really good news. Now, what does this mean for industries? So this data here, um, we are looking at both labour force survey data, which is employment data, which is that first column, and we're also looking at the change in payroll jobs. So the change in payroll jobs data was a measure introduced by the ABS very early on in the pandemic to try and get a, a handle on what was actually happening with jobs. So this measure here looks at number of jobs, which doesn't equate to employment because it doesn't take into account that some of these jobs may be held by more than by one, by, by one person. So there might be, you know, multiple or one person working multiple jobs. But it's a fairly good indicator and, and kind of the most current data we've got as to the state of different industries across Queensland. So I've obviously highlighted in red there, healthcare and social assistance. You can see the employment. Now, this, this is from February 2020. In November 2020, this is the data that will be updated on Thursday. But um, during that time, which is kind of the bulk of the, the pandemic, you can see that healthcare and social assistance employment in that increased by zero. Oh, well, it's 400 people, basically. At the same time, there was actually a decline in payroll jobs. So what that says to me is some of that casual, casual work disappeared, but uh, more people were needed for, to do, to do full-time work. If you look at retail trade below that, you can see that employment fell in that, in that industry by about 2,300 people, but the number of jobs actually increased. And that indicates to me that there was a big rise in casual and part-time work. So there was a, an overall increase in jobs, but it was being done by the same people. Um, and, and in effect, we actually lost employment in that. Um, you can see that uh, I've highlighted in, in or bolded in black, those kind of industries which have actually, where employment has actually increased uh, between February and November last year. Um, and so you can see agriculture, forestry and fishing, employment in that just, just kind of skyrocketed over the year. It never even, even faltered during the pandemic. And then you've got a number of industries down the bottom there, starting from, say, around transport, postal and warehousing, 
you've had falls in employment and also falls in payroll jobs. Um, and this, these are probably those industries that are most affected by ongoing border closures or the sporadic border closures and lockdowns that we've experienced. So transport, postal and warehousing, loss of jobs and loss of, um, loss of employment. And that, of course, is contained, that industry uh, contains air and water transport. So you're looking at your airlines, you're looking at your cruise ships. Information and TV, media and telecommunications, that kind of decline is associated with that drying up of opportunities in the screen industry. Um, other services contains, is a big industry division that contains a, a number of different, different industries such as uh, beauty, therapy, hairdressing, tattooing, funeral services, those personal services, and those are obviously most effective when you have some sort of restrictions on movement or on lockdowns. Um, administrative and support services as an industry contains uh, travel agencies. So, and they've, they've obviously been affected and will continue to be affected with border shutdowns. Accommodation and food services probably needs no explanation. Um, a big loss of employment, almost 14,000, almost and over 10,000 jobs lost um, over the year. And arts and recreation services has also been very badly affected with, with over 17,000 people uh, losing work in arts and recreation and, and a fall of almost 5,000 jobs. So we can see that COVID-19 and the associated uh, responses to that have affected industries at a very different rate and it even affected the way uh, employment uh, occurs within those industries. So in some of them you've seen, uh, while employment has increased, you've actually seen a loss of jobs, which is most likely that loss of casual and, and part-time work. Right, so let's get to anticipating future skills. So what is anticipating future skills? Well, I'm glad you asked. Okay, it's a set of economic modelling. Um, this is our second second lot of projections. Um, we, we have, Four scenarios as such. The first is a baseline. So the baseline is business as usual. And that set of employment projections is based uh, on Queensland government um, forecasts. We look at uh, real-time economic and, and industry data, and, and that gives us our, our basic set of projections, I guess. Um, and now the data is available for occupations, industries, regions, and qualifications. Um, which is all based on ABS classifications. And the data I have here. Um, shows you the, the breakdown, the way the ABS classifies industries and occupations and, um, and education. So all in all, we've got around 214 industries that you can get data for. We've got almost 360 occupations and you've got education uh, qualifications available in two kind of, uh, kind of spheres. One is the level of education and then we've also got fields of education, which is the kind, the kind of um, qualifications that people are studying. So I've just indicated here, I've given an example of the way that hierarchical classification works. So if you look at the, the left-hand side there, um, the industry division is agriculture, forestry and fishing. That breaks down further into subdivisions and I've just shown one, which is agriculture. And then under agriculture, that breaks down into more industry unit groups. So I've just shown you that there's a dairy farming, but you could also see sheep and beef farming. Um, you could see uh, tree farming and the nuts and fruit. So it breaks down to, into a fairly um, granular level, likewise with occupations and likewise with education. Now, I mentioned that we actually have four scenarios. So obviously the baseline is probably the one that most people would be interested in, but we also developed three other scenarios because we really wanted to get people thinking about how uh, changes to circumstances may affect employment. So those three scenarios are technological change, which is of interest to everyone, I think, uh, we also looked at a changing workforce, and for that we looked at uh, increasing levels of interstate migration, which is actually what's happening in Queensland now. We're, we're seeing that we're receiving very high um, movements from interstate, um, and we've also had an external impact. So we wanted to do a shock that was kind of beyond uh, beyond the control of anyone, and with that what we did was uh, dropped the price of coal and iron ore by 50%. And what that ends up doing is uh, causing a fall in the Australian dollar, and that has uh, ongoing changes and effects of employment across industries, regions, um, in, in a variety of ways. So the other thing we have done, um, and this one's not publicly available, we actually developed a, a fifth scenario, I guess you could call it. Um, earlier on in the pandemic, we commissioned our modeler to have a look at potential effects of COVID-19. Now, 
With the other scenarios, we take these out and test our underlying assumptions and results with, with industry um, to make sure we haven't kind of missed anything. We haven't had the opportunity to do that with this particular scenario. So it's untested. Um, it was commissioned just as the second Victorian outbreak um, was, was, was uh, underway. So it doesn't take into effect the economic effects of that. It doesn't obviously look at recent shutdowns in like the border between Queensland and Greater Sydney or anything that's happening on a national level. So I would use these figures. This is just, it's just very much trend, which is why I haven't really put the, put the, the, the uh, access there. But as you can see, what we're roughly saying for the state of Queensland and employment growth compared baseline compared to COVID-19, um, obviously, Growth of growth and employment uh, quite down in 2020, 2021. That's that maroon or pink um, bar. Um, we're looking at a quite a re big recovery in employment in 2022, um, and then a slowing down of recovery and employment growth in 23, 24. What where that leaves us is by 2024, we're seeing around 7.3, 2.73 million people uh, were projected to be employed in Queensland. We're seeing that as slightly smaller, around 17,000 fuel people by 2024. As I said, very preliminary data. Um, I think the trends are probably right. It, it's the quantum that could be it could be different, but we just wanted to show you that to, to show you where our thinking lies. And I'll show you something around health a little bit later. Um, right, so this is now returning back to, to the anticipated future skills data that we have. And this is just looking at projected employment growth. And uh, as David mentioned in his introduction, healthcare and social assistance projected to be both the biggest employer in the state, but also projected to have, um, you know, the highest rate of growth. And I'm guessing that I'm probably talking to the, to the converted there that you all know that. Um, again, these figures came out, were finalised pre-COVID. Uh, so while, we're, while we think some of the trends, uh, underlying trends are still um, solid, uh, we're probably not that um, confident that the actual figures are correct anymore. We are actually currently working on our third series, uh, which will contain um, the impacts of COVID. So we would expect that to be released later this year. Um, but we just thought it would be useful for you to know that this data is available for you now. Um, this was our projections uh, for healthcare and social assistance in the baseline and also with our COVID-19 projections. So you can see that under this, that maroon line is the baseline. So we were already projecting that there was going to be quite high growth in that industry. But you can see that under COVID-19, we are looking at a substantial increase in that growth, um, maybe tapering off as we get to around 2024. So what does that mean for some of the industry groups? So this is where we're starting to break down into those, uh, those subdivisions and industries. So you can see here, um, again, this is the pre-COVID figures, but if you just look at what I've just shown you around um, growth in the whole sector, the whole industry under COVID, then just amplify these figures, I would say. Um, so we can see that we're projecting uh, the greatest employment in hospitals, but the greatest increase in employment, um, residential care services, um, allied health services and also hospitals. So, but you know, um, across the state, the average employment growth is around seven point four percent. So you can see that we're looking at all these industry groups as having above average employment growth out to twenty twenty four. I've also looked at uh, occupations and health related occupations, and again. Um, you can see that the first figure there is the number that we anticipate uh, of projected workers in those occupations. And then we're also looking at uh, what that growth has been between 2020 and 2024. And you can see there that almost all of these occupations are gonna experience above average growth, which as David says, has some implications around uh, any shortages or skill shortages, et cetera. Um, there's gonna be quite a strong demand for workers in a variety of occupations at all different levels from the clinical through to administrative and support and even the technical, technical areas. So the good news is I'll make sure that these slides are pre presented to you so you don't have to kind of have a photographic memory and try and get this in information in all at once now. Uh, the other message I guess it was really important to talk about is uh, we're obviously going to have a more educated workforce. So this is looking at fields of 
fields of education and we've looked at all the broken it down into all the health fields. Uh, once again, going back to that 7.4%, um, we can see that the workforce is going to be more educated across all of the fields, the uh, fields of qualifications that are available in the health, health area. Uh, no surprise probably that the nursing workforce is going to be the largest and also uh, have one of the greatest rates of uh, growth. But we can also see behavioural science, medical studies, uh, much higher rates of people with, with qualifications in those fields. Uh, if we look at it another way, which is by uh, actual levels of qualifications, you can also see that there are going to remain to be pe people in the health workforce uh, with a variety of qualifications. They're, the greatest number of those will be people with a bachelor degree. Um, the greatest growth of people in health with qualification levels will be in the postgraduate. You can see that there's a fairly even spread and the vet sector is still going to play a pretty important role in terms of providing people with uh, workers with qualifications in health by 2024. So that's the actual end of, of the data. What I did want to say is that we've now made it uh, easier for you to, to look at this data yourself. So if you go onto our Anticipating Future Skills website, the URL is up there, what you can see is we've provided a number of different resources where you can get this data for yourself or even explore it in more detail. We've got a report um, which pretty much provides just a high-level summary, but we've also made uh, available a, what we've got, the AFS portal, which is uh, very illustrative. It's, it's quite um, it's a dashboard which allows you to, to see um, quite visually the changes in your selected regions, industries, occupations or qualifications. There's also a data explorer which lets you do a little bit more advanced comparisons or um, analysis of the data. So when you go into the data portal, you will see this. Um, this is kind of an overview of the, of the information that you can expect to see. You then have the opportunity, if you look at the top there, there's a number of different fields. So you can actually explore those. You can look at different occupations, industries, regions, et cetera. Um, when you go into those uh, specific uh, pages, uh, you'll be presented with a whole heap of different options where you can select your own occupations at different levels, industries at different levels, you can look at different regions, et cetera, and you'll be able to see for yourself um, what the projected employment outcome, out, what the employment projections are for your specific choice and area of interest. When you come into this front field, you can also, uh, if you hover over onto that map on the left, you'll also get regional statistics and data and you can actually click through that way. Um, you can see to the right there, this is like the overview data. You can also select the different scenarios to see what will happen at a Queensland level for that. So that's the data portal. Um, I wanted to draw your attention. This is new for people who might not have, who might be familiar with the old data, um, but not have looked at this at our second, second um, release. So we've actually got replacement demand as well. The data in anticipating future skills is mostly um, about new jobs, but we understand that in terms of actual total job openings, obviously uh, there are opportunities for both new jobs but also replacement demand. So when people, people leave an occupation, they might retire, they might move on. This is the, the page you will see. You can see that if you want to, you can select a specific occupation, you can select a specific year or a scenario. But you can see just here from this page that, say, for example, personal carers and assistants, the dark blue bar indicates uh, how many new jobs we are projecting at 20, by 2024 and also how many additional jobs there will be just because of that replacement factor. So you're looking at about 1,600 and the, the box on the right shows you the total that are, that's available for all those, um, for those occupations. You can see that the second one there, sales assistants and salespersons, there's actually more job opportunities, opportunities available in that occupation due to replacement rather than there is to new jobs. So you can use this one to have a look at total job, job openings, um, which we, I thought might be of use to you in your planning. Um, and finally, the data explorer. So this is where you can do a little bit more uh, of a deep dive, I guess. You can compare. So basically, on you, you select your occupations, industries, regions, whatever your perimeters are on your first, the first thing you want to compare, your second comparison. So you might want to look at uh, an industry in an occupation in Queensland versus that same industry occupation in a specific region. Um, once you select that, you'll get this little overview, but you also then can click through and look at the actual specific data related to that occupation, the industry you've selected or the regions you've selected. Now, I know this has been a kind of a very quick run through. Um, 
really happy if you want to get onto the data portal or explore and if you have any issues, please uh, ensure you contact us. Um, as I said, we're currently looking at developing our third uh, set of data. So that will contain the COVID-19 um, real-time statistics. Uh, we will no doubt be, be asking Checkup to help us with our testing and validation. So some of you might get a little bit of an invite to come to a workshop to make sure that our underpinning assumptions are correct and that we haven't missed any major industry trends. Uh, if you're interested in that or just interested in the work of Jobs Queensland more broadly, um, you can stay in contact with us. So you can you know, subscribe to our e-news, you can follow us on LinkedIn or you can actually uh, uh, subscribe to us on Twitter as well. So I would encourage you to, to go in, have a look at those two tools, start with the data portal and, um, you know, you can look at that specific data for your own regions. You can pick, pick um, some of those industry subsets or you can look at particular occupations and see what we have projected. And that, otherwise that's it for me. Thanks so much, Shaz. Um, I'm just looking over at the questions. There aren't any at the moment, mm -hmm. but as you say, people might need some time to digest and actually go and explore um, your website, which is always evolving, always, you know, this is the third time, as I said, you've presented, but there's always something new, um, new data coming out. So, so thanks so much, Shaz. Really appreciate uh, you spending the time with us this morning. No problem, Dave. And as I said, I'll, um, I'll email this to you so that if people want a copy of the presentation, they'll have that there. Fantastic. Thank you. So if you could just stop sharing yeah. the screen now. There we go. Okay, so I guess Shaz has really nicely presented an overview of, of the industry, of the health and community services industry. Um, now we're going to look at, uh, in a moment, some projects that are working on growing their own workforce. But first, um, check up me and Sabrina, as you can see, are online. And we'd like to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in the last two years. Uh, workforce is a relatively new area for us, and it did commence a couple of years ago with the development of, you can see my shirt, the Choose Your Own Health Career website and the Grow Your Own website. And then more recently, the Health Industry to Schools program and the Industry Skills Advisor program. So Sabrina and I are going to co-present this one. I'll just um, share my screen now. One moment. Okay. Can you see that, Sam? Yep. How's that? All good? Okay, so as I said, it's um, Sabrina and I, and um, I'll just point out the other members of our team. They're, they're online today, but they're not on video. So we have, many of you will know Vicky Meyer. She's our industry skills advisor for health, and that position has been going almost 12 months. We also have Marianne Quilter, who's online. Hi, Marianne. Um, she works on our Gateway to Schools program with Sam Welling, who's standing beside her there. And then, of course, there's Sabrina. Uh, and then there's me, who oversees the programs uh, here at Checkup. So, uh, Sabrina, you're going to kick off. Um, well, there, there's the four programs I just mentioned. And as I, as, as I said, um, it's really good to have that team approach. So, we work very closely together. So and these are very intertwined. So we're really working collectively, um, attending events together, going around the state, Vicky and I going up to Cairns um, next month to meet with local industry up there. So it's, it's really a, an exciting program for Checkup and um, hopefully we'll get to um, engage with some of, you, some of the people online today. I see a lot of familiar names online and some people perhaps we haven't engaged with. Um, so you probably will Get a phone call from Vicky at some point if this is your area of interest, workforce. Um, she's doing a lot of consultation around the state. So, Sab, um, you're going to kick off with uh, Choose Your Own. Yep, no worries. So, thanks, everyone. Um, I wanted to discuss a couple of online um, workforce resources that we actually have available um, that were originally funded through Queensland Health in consultation with a large range of industry experts from within the health and community sector. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the Choose Your Own Health Career website, which some of you may be familiar with. So I apologise if you're very familiar with this website, but I guess for the benefit of those who aren't, this um, would be valuable for you. So. Um, just by way of background, the Choose Your Own Health Career website was uh, originally developed or we were engaged, I guess, by Queensland Health um, 
back in 2019 as part of the Health Education to Employment Pathways Project. And this involved the development and promotion of an online resource called the Choose Your Own Health Career website. The um, overall aim of the Reds website was to provide guidance to students who might be considering a career in health, but not really sure where to start. So the website targets high school students, school leavers, vet coordinators, career advisors, parents, guidance, guidance officers, so forth. Um, and it really helps to highlight the range of, um, I guess, health careers and uh, career pathways that can be achieved through a vocational education and training pathway. And as I mentioned before, um, we undertook consultation with a range of industry experts from across the health and community services sector to identify a number of jobs which were in high demand, where skill shortages um, were experienced and also where there was strong growth predicted across within the next five to 10 years. So next slide, please, David. <laughs> yeah, is Sorry. it progressing? <laughs> That's all right. There we go. That's okay. So um, one element of the website is um, a number of key career health pathways. So, uh, and these particularly are ones that can be achieved through a VET pathway. And to date we have 15 career pathways included on the website. And of course, with a plan to add more over the coming years. Um, this is where students, teachers, VET officers, us, career advisors can go in and actually learn about the different qualifications and courses that they can study or students can study um, and in order to achieve you know uh, qualifications and further education and employment as well. So next slide and that's an example of what a career pathway might look like. So as you can see it's broken down this particular one is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Practitioner Career Pathway and it's broken down um, by Australian qualification framework levels, indicating the particular qualification, whether there's any relevant job outcomes as a result of those qualifications and links to personal stories, case studies and other additional resources and information. Um, the next element of the website are job profiles. So we have a number of job profiles on the website which outline descriptions of the jobs, required skills, um, an approximate salary and also employment statistics as well. And to date we have 34 job profiles included on the website. So they're a great way to learn more about the job, what it involves, what are some of the personal attributes required for the job as well, um, to help students get an understanding of what might be involved in the job and where they might work as well. And this is an example of a job profile. So as you can see, provides a bit of a descriptor about the job, where they might work, whether it's within the community, within primary healthcare, hospital setting, for example, or within people's homes. Um, what are some of the skills that are required to um, be you know, an individual who works in that, in that particular career? And if available, an approximate salary as well, just to give an indication for students exploring different kinds of health careers. Doing well, David, with those slide progressions. <laughs> um, the next, um, so yeah, so sorry, this is, um, the next element is personal stories. And this is where uh, there are a range of different um, real life stories of individuals who have um, attained a, a successful qualification within the health sector through um, a VET pathway. To date, we have 30 personal stories on the website. And again, we're continuing to build on these personal stories through our existing workforce programs. Um, but of course, if you have any personal stories or, or individuals that you're aware of that would be valuable to share their story, please do get in touch because we are continually building on those stories. And I do encourage you to read through the personal stories because they're an excellent way to highlight that no to study career or, or health career journey is the same. And just an example of Megan, who is um, who gained an employment in as uh, within health administration, and um, again just highlights her story and her journey um, by asking a few specific interview questions and her responses to those questions. So again, just a great read. Takes the readers through um, the individual's journey. And Sab, so I'll just point out we do yep. have just, um, written stories at the moment, but our plans are to um, do some video stories as well. This was all happening last year and um, COVID hit. So all those plans to film got put on hold, but that's yeah. on our list um, yeah. to do this year. Thanks, David.
Um, in addition, we have some personal, um, sorry, patient journeys, which are really hypothetical situations of a patient entering um, the health sector and how the different health roles will interact with the patient. So just another way to um, present how those different roles interact and how and, and quite a, an extensive number of different roles as well that might interact with a patient. Um, and in addition, there's a number of uh, additional resources uh, around training, recruitment and also funding to support teachers, vet officers and so forth. Yeah. So to find out more, um, that's the direct link down the bottom of the slide. We do have an Instagram account as well, just to stay in touch. And if you, of course, that's the QR code if you want to um, access access the website via your phone as well. We will, we will send these slides as well. Um, yep. to yeah. Okay, so the next resource I wanted to talk about is the Grow Your Own Workforce. Now, this particular resource, again, was developed in consultation with a range of industry um, industry stakeholders uh, funded by Queensland Health and originally developed by Queensland Health as well. Recently handed over to check up to manage and also continue to grow on this resource. The overall aim is about um, developing the health sector's efforts to uh, develop a capable and sustainable health workforce. So what do we mean by Grow Your Own? Well, it's a place-based workforce initiative, which um, you probably are, are very familiar with. And it's all about attracting and recruiting and developing and supporting and retaining <laughs> local residents. Um, it could be any age, any background, any cultural background, to, to create that sustainable pipeline of workers within your in, within the particular industry. Um, originally, this Grow Your Own Workforce was developed specifically for health services, but it can be used more broadly across any sector. And um, it involves two complementary, well, separate approaches, but they are complementary with, within themselves as well. And that's an outside in approach and also an inside up approach. So um, it's really, the, the development of the website was designed to be a one-stop shop for organisations, um, to provide them with a range of tools, a range of guides as well, two, two guides in particular, an outside-in guide and an inside-up guide, um, and provide information about funding, recruitment, training, and good case study, good practice case study examples as well. There are a number of case studies on the website, if you want to just flick to the next slide, David. Um, both which cover outside in approaches and inside up approaches. So these um, outline uh, the different approaches that organisations have undertaken in order to uh, have well um, result in successful outcomes. Majority of these websites, sorry, these case studies are health specific, but there are some that are from other sectors as well. So again, we're continuing to build on these case studies, um, not just from within the health sector, but more broadly as well. As I mentioned before, there are a range of resources available to support organisations. Um, that includes resources to support uh, attracting, recruiting and developing local health workforce or just local workforce in general, and also resources targeting specific population groups such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations, culturally and linguistically diverse populations and um, disadvantaged populations as well. And I mentioned before, yeah, so there is a specific Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce section within the website. So providing a range of uh, resources to support Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce recruitment um, and um, attract, attraction as well. And yes, again, if you want to learn more, head straight to the website, um, but happy to answer any questions you have about um, any of the resources. Uh, so feel free to post through any questions if you have them, but I will pass it back to David now. Thank you, Sabrina. I'm just conscious of time. So we're, we're a little bit behind schedule, so I might I'll probably rush through a little because um, I've got two programs to tell you about. Um, and as I said, these are new programs for checkup, both starting in March last year. And these two programs, uh, the Gateway Program and the uh, Industry Skills Advisor, are funded by Desbit. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Gateway to Industry Skills Program, which has been going for around nine, 10 years and has involved other industries, but health came on board along with three other uh, industries. So there's now a total of 10, <coughs> excuse me, 10 industries uh, working with schools 
Uh, and, and there's the general aim of the Health Gateway program. It's really about linking schools with industry, providing those learning opportunities, real life learning opportunities. And again, you know, it was the worst time, worst time possible to start a new project in March last year. So uh, a lot of our approach had to go virtual. Uh, so we're hoping this year will be a little bit more normal and uh, be able to provide more hands-on uh, learning experiences for children at schools. There's also a professional development component. So vet coordinators and teachers, we can provide um, training and upskilling, uh, the vet opportunities, and also really with the goal of leading to employment. And there's some great examples around um, the state where, where kids are getting those um, training ships and then going on to employment in their, in their field. Uh, so we've really been all about engaging with schools, uh, telling them about the program. We we're really in that introductory phase last year and we were really quite overwhelmed at the level of interest. There, what, there was, and there still is a lot, there were a lot of schools already involved in health education through, through VET courses. So they were very keen to, to jump on board um, and, and join the program. And now they're able to share their expertise with other schools who may just be beginning uh, their journey. But I think we're up to around 32 schools so far. And there's just some of the, the regional Queensland schools uh, that have signed on to the program. There's an MOU process uh, to formally engage in the, in the process. Uh, and then in um, Southeast Queensland as well, um, we've had a lot of interest. Um, I mentioned the team before. So Sabrina, she looks after, it got such a, it's such a big job that um, we needed three staff and we've divided the state up. So Sabrina's looking after Metro South and Gold Coast. Sam's looking after those ones there and Marianne, uh, you can see the areas she's uh, looking, looking after. Uh, and as I say, we will send this um, presentation. So if you're in one of these particular regions and you want more information, you can get in touch with your relevant contact who can um, provide you more information or even come and visit um, you in your region. Uh, as I said, there's uh, a process. Uh, so this was all established last year. Schools join up, we visit the school, talk about uh, what's involved. They do an activity plan and then we have an MOU signing. And later today, we'll hear from Bentley Park College and they were actually the first school in Queensland uh, to join the program last year. As I say, up to about 32 schools at the moment. Uh, it's not just for the older year levels, years 11 and 12, who may be um, engaging in VET courses, but we're also looking at uh, this three-staged approach. So to inform the younger students uh, through maybe just uh, guest speakers or talks, uh, maybe a visiting ambulance uh, officer or something like that at a school, and then engaging uh, as they get older and then finally involving them in experiential learning. Uh, and our team, it's really very resource um, driven. We, we want to provide those resources at school to make it easier for schools that schools need. So we're busy developing a webinar series and videos, doing regional networking events, uh, posters, etc. Uh, and the new gateway to, so we have the Choose Your Own website and this one, they're linked, um, but this was just launched a couple of weeks ago. So we're still building, but there's already quite a lot of information on that website. So the web address is there, gateway2health.com.au. So please check that out when you've got some time. Uh, oh, and I should just say it is governed by a reference group and you can see um, quite an extensive um, industry, um, group there, uh, lots of partners who are really helping to make this program a success. Uh, and the, the last program we'll talk about this morning is our, another new one, the Industry Skills Advisor for Health. It's, it's a program, but it's also a person. Uh, and that person is Vicky Meyer. Uh, many of you will know Vicky. She's very experienced in this space. And um, I think it's fair to say one of the experts in Queensland around um, the health industry. She's online today. Um, hi, Vicky. I uh, hope you don't mind me saying that, but um, Vicky is really doing lots of consultation. She's, she's listening to what people are, are saying. And as I say, we're going up to Cairns. We'll be going to other areas of the state um, to, to hear that and see the um, see the see what's happening in the regions firsthand. Um, 
But formally, her, her role is, as I said, to engage with employers, small business, stakeholders, to provide that high quality evidence-based advice and intelligence back to Desbit, uh, back to the minister. Um, and there's some of the areas around uh, the, the direction, regional skills needs uh, is very important. And that's why we're linking in with Jobs Queensland. You know, we're looking at jobs growth and employment opportunities as well. Um, and also looking at the training, the HLT training package. And Vicky's identified some areas through her initial consultation, um, some key areas for her to focus on are around digital literacy. And that came to the fore last year um, with COVID and telehealth and um, those sort of um, new systems, mental health, mental health, alcohol and other drugs, rural and remote workforce, a big focus for us and also of course Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce. So just a very quick snapshot of, of Vicky's um, role and all our contact details are here and so if you wanted to learn more about what Vicky's doing or what Sabrina's doing in the Gold Coast schools, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you've got our contacts and we'll send this around um, so you can um, get in contact with us. So that's just a quick um, overview of those four initiatives that Checkup's undertaking. Now we really want to hear from some examples of, have I stopped sharing? There we go. Um, we want to hear some examples and we're really fortunate today to have two um, stories from regional Queensland uh, around some Grow Your Own uh, initiatives. And firstly, we're going to hear from Ono Van S, who's from the Mackay Hospital and Health Service. Ono's program, which is relatively new, I believe, and it's called Big Dreams, Small Steps. Have I got that right, Ono? That's correct, David, yeah. And Ono's working, I know you're working with North Queensland PHN and, and lots of other organisations on this program. So uh, over to you, Ono, if you'd like to share your screen and tell us about uh, Big Dreams, Small Steps. Yeah, and let me just um, down the bottom there. Sorry, see. I'm just trying. That's okay. Yeah, it's not coming up at the moment. It's normally on the bottom, isn't it? Yeah, it should it should say participants and then a green share screen. No, Lisa, can you just check if. Let's try that, um, yeah. That should work. Just to, while Ono is funny that don't forget you can ask questions through the Q&A. So um, keep those coming during um, Ono's uh, presentation. Is it giving you the option, Ono? Uh, it's, yeah, it's just not seem, doesn't oh. seem to be really respond at all. Hang on, I've got your I've got your presentation. Okay, that's fine. I'm happy for you to drive it too, David. Are you okay with it? If you'd like to start talking, I'll be two minutes to get that. Sure, no problem. Look, uh, thanks very much, David and Sam as well for the opportunity for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so to talk about our program. So my name is Ono. I'm the manager for HR strategy and engagement for Mackay Hospital and Health Service. And we started the program, which is really an, an education to employment type program that we've, um, we've looked at for some time. And we've um, actually got to the point earlier this, uh, this month uh, to implement it as well. So a lot of planning and obviously some challenges with COVID-19 during that planning phase as well. But, um, but very much um, on the way now after planning this for, for about a year and a half, two years or so. So if you look at our region, um, we had a slide before one of the 16 hospital and health services in, in Queensland. Um, we have a fairly large geographical area. We look after about 180, 200,000 people, so relatively small population, but at the same time quite spread throughout uh, the region. So we cover the Wood Sunday region, we cover the Isaac region, uh, and obviously we cover the, uh, the Mackay region as well. So quite a large geographical area. So the next slide, David, is... Um, is, um, we've done that, the acknowledgement, that's just the, the area itself. Now, in terms of the organisation, we do have um, a strategic plan, of course. Of, of course, our vision is to deliver Queensland's best rural and regional healthcare with a purpose of to deliver outstanding healthcare services to our communities, through our people and partners. And our values, which are very much developed by the staff uh, over the last few years, 
um, our collaboration, trust, respect, and teamwork. So it just gives you a little bit of a flavour of where we're located and uh, what we stand for in terms of our vision, purpose, and values as well. So the program itself, it's called Big Dreams, Small Steps. And we've made a very conscious effort to make sure that the program is actually recognised, not just in our local uh, UE name in the Aboriginal language, but also um, recognising um, Eastern Torres Strait and Western Torres Strait dialect. So uh, the program name itself was actually a project on itself and took about two months or so. And uh, we were really keen to have an obviously an English name, but also a, a local name and recognising the, the local Indigenous language as well. Um, and that was set up um, through a small subcommittee that we set up just recognising the fact that um, we're not just targeting students of Aboriginal um, background, but also, of course, Torres Strait Islander background. So we wanted to make sure that in our programme name, we acknowledge both the, um, the Aboriginal language, but also Western and Eastern Torres Strait um, dialect as well. So I'm um, quite pleased with it. And uh, certainly the, the elders within our region were, were quite um, excited about having the opportunity to be involved uh, to that level of detail as well. So what is the Big Dream Small Steps program? Well, it's a pilot program developed to inspire, educate, engage, and motivate young Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in the health industry. So we um, are fully focusing on Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students, um, and we are very much coming from the grow your own type um, philosophy, um, and also really keen to not just have the education outcome, but also have the employment outcome. And when we started doing our research a couple of years ago, we, we heard a lot of stories about people and organisations that have done a lot of work in providing certificates, certificate two and certificate three courses, but quite often there wasn't a real outcome um, and quite often uh, significant money invested as well, but not necessarily having the employment outcome. So we've looked at a number of programmes uh, one of the programs we looked at was the, the Deadly Start program uh, in Metro North Hospital Health Service. Um, and we've had a number of discussions with them and uh, they've been very, very open in sharing some of their experiences with it. And uh, we had we started a similar approach in the Mackay region to focus also on that strong employment outcome afterwards as well. Now it does address the three um, areas, um, so education, employment and healthcare challenges. And we're also, of course, reducing the barriers to attending training uh, and work for young Aboriginal Torres Strait uh, support and partnership. So there's been a whole range of philosophies behind it in getting this off the ground. And um, it's tracking quite well with, uh, like I said before, a start earlier this month. So next slide. Um, so why this program? Uh, and this has been quite important from a board discussion point of view. Now, we do have a, a current workforce of about 2% Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander um, people in our organisation. We have a workforce of about a, lot, a little bit over 3,000 headcount. Um, and when we started looking at our local statistics, we actually um, have a, a percentage of 5% in our, in our local community of being of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander background. So even though the initial target from Queensland Health was 2% workforce, the stretch target being 3% set by Queensland Health. The board discussions we've had about a year and a half, two years ago, were very much along the lines of, why don't we set the target of our workforce in line with our, our actual figures in the community, which is closer to 5%. So that's a decision that's been made. And certainly strategically in discussions I'm have, having with the board that really formed the trigger point for this particular project as well. Um, obviously engaging a workforce that reflects the community we serve, um, supporting the entrance of young Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in the health industry. And uh, we've heard from shares before, just the, the, the upcoming um, demands and the current demand, but certainly upcoming demand as well in the industry. Um, and obviously to help Mackay HHS increase the employment of Aboriginal Islander staff. So this is one project that we started. It is an important project. It's probably medium long-term. It's not necessarily an immediate result. But with this program, we're aiming to go from our current 2% Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander workforce to about 5%. That's really what we're aiming for. So next slide, funding and partnership. So we have allocated a, an AO5 level position um, in my team. Um, and um, that person is, um, has actually had a, a fairly uh, significant vet sector background and also a university lecturing Background, um, we purposely made a decision to for that position to be identified. 
Um, and obviously, um, it, it's too big to, to just um, add to an existing project officer within my team. So we really created a designated position. Um, we entered a formal partnership with North Queensland PHN. Um, they've been our really strong partners in this, in this process. And it hasn't just been the financial benefit, but it's really been the, the broader benefit of, of state and federal government working together. Um, and then in September 2019, we, um, we actually started um, developing a steering committee. So we thought it would be really important not just to, to have the two organisations, North Queensland PHN, Mackay Hospital and Health Service working on this, but actually go much, much broader. So if you look at our relatively small community in Mackay, we do have representatives um, on that governance committee, and that's the broader oversight. So that's it is quite involved, Education Queensland. We have a number of elders. Um, I generally chair it, but we also have our, our chief exec quite involved as well. So it is a quite a, a broad governance oversight, and it's worked really well because most of the partners and, and, um, and governance members seem to all be keen for the same sort of outcome. So rather than all working in silos, we, we collectively working on, uh, on improving this. Ideally within Mackay HHS, that increase in, in uh, percentage, but really anywhere within the Mackay region um, is a benefit. The other thing is we've uh, went through a process of obtaining a GTO. Um, as you know, the group training organization technically becomes the employer for the students. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we have a GTO that um, is um, actually has a, a very high a cultural capability as well. So we ended up with Australian Training Works. They are Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander owned and managed. Um, and uh, for us, the way we wrote that specification in the beginning for the GTO, it was really important to have that high level of cultural capability within the GTO. Now we did a similar thing for the RTO appointment. Uh, obviously a number of um, universities and um, education organizations uh, applied for that as well, but we found a similar thing in CQ University. Lots of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander support and lots of mechanisms in place to make sure that the staff support is, is really high during this program. So in terms of steps, we um, have January 2021, the pre-employment qualification Cert 2 in health support services. So we launched that a couple of weeks ago um, at the CQU campus uh, in the CBD in Mackay. Uh, lots of interest in it, uh, a lot of people involved. Obviously the students, their parents, their guardians, uh, we had a lot of coverage, Channel 7, Channel 9, uh, and obviously quite well promoted within the region. We made a conscious decision to make sure that the Cert 2 is completed first before we start looking at the school-based trainee and the Certificate 3 level. And it's something we've, we've learned from some of the other organisations who have done this. They just felt that when they started with a Certificate 3, in some cases, it was just too much of a, of, a, of a workload and perhaps a little bit of a surprise in some cases too. So the Cert 2 really acts as a, as a bit of an appetiser and seeing if, if the students are really interested in continuing health or not. Uh, we purposely started with 20 students in the Certificate 2 uh, and we have 15 spots available for the Certificate 3. So we assume there will be some natural attrition from those 20 uh, and we're aiming to continue with ideally 15 students uh, from July 21 onwards to do the full Cert 3 course itself. So, um, so that's, the, uh, that's the process itself. At this stage, it is very much a pilot a program. Um, so we have been quite focused on delivering this within Mackay itself, and, um, but once it works uh, and um, we have some successes and we have ongoing support from North Queensland PHN and from our board, we'll most likely start going much broader, so beyond Mackay itself as a city and start delivering this to um, some of our rural um, areas as well, because we do have um, eight hospitals in total and four community health centres. So if this works in Mackay with 15 students, we'll most likely go much broader and perhaps also increase the, um, the, the 15 students we have in the pilot program initially. So next slide. Um, oh, just a couple of photos. I think that's the last slide actually. So that was the launch of the pre-employment qualification a few weeks ago. Um, so quite a large event in one of the lecture rooms at, um, at CQU uh, for the campus. And, um, and like I said, very well received, but just a couple of images. I'm not sure if there's another slide there, David, I can't re recall it, but um, just a couple of images of, um, of what that looks like in itself. 
So um, that's the presentation itself. I'm happy to take any questions. It's been quite an enjoyable ride for us. It's, it's very much started strategically for us um, at that board level. And um, it's really nice to, I remember having some discussions with Vicky on this a few years ago too. It's nice to actually see this all come into fruition with, uh, with a really good kickoff of the certificate through uh, certificate two last month. Thanks so much, Ono. Yeah, it looks like you're off to a, a great start. Lots of local interest up there. So yeah. I think that's going to be the key to your success, the, the way you've engaged locally. And yeah, um, yeah so congratulations on that um, program. That's really great. Um, and as I said, we've got another um, local initiative here and it's um, Dan, Dan, can I just check, are you going to be sharing your screen? Yep. Oh, you're on. We can uh, yeah, we should be able to. I'll see if I can do it. I think I mentioned in my talk that Bentley Puck uh, College uh, has the honour, I guess, of being our first gateway to industry school in Queensland. That was launched last year. And, and again, some amazing things happening up there. Great partnerships. Uh, and today we have uh, the principal of uh, Bentley Park, uh, Bruce Horton, and the, I don't know your exact title, I think it's Industry Engagement um, Liaison person, Dan, um, Dan Giddle. Yeah, that's, that, that's probably one of the- Jack, Jack of all trades, we call him up here, David. So um, thanks for coming along today. I know you're busy with the, the school year well underway now. So um, thanks for taking the time to, to share um, your work with us. Oh, look, it's indeed an honor to be invited to actually share some of our work. And, and you're right, David, we, are, we were the first school in the um, state to have the privilege of taking the Gateways to Industry Partnership on board with um, uh, in, in relation to health. Uh, it's a completely new area for us um, and uh, and we're really getting stuck into it and we're seeing some amazing results already. So we're only, only fairly new in the game. Well, just a bit of context about Bentley Park College. Uh, we're, we've got the advantage of being a prep to 12 uh, school. We've got 1,665 students located on the south side of Cairns. Um, we're, we're the biggest educational institution in the southern corridor of Cairns. And, um, and, and we see ourselves very much of having the advantage of being prep to 12 and students can achieve their complete education on the one campus here in the college. Uh, we've got a, uh, uh, we're fortunate to have a very high um, Indigenous, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population in the school, um, uh, around the 40% mark. And, um, and, and this is one of the reasons why we've really um, taken this opportunity that we've been given and really run with. Um, because we see this as a very, very much an opportunity for us to work with our local Indigenous community. Uh, and, and we've got very high and in, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands. So we've got a lot of kids that actually come out of the islands and live with family down here. Um, we, we are what you would call a low socioeconomic school, although we don't use that as an excuse in any way. We don't dwell on that. Uh, our X year scale, we're a seventh percentile. Um, at around the 870 mark, it, it fluctuates from year to year, but we would be considered in educational circumstances to be an educationally disadvantaged school. However, we don't believe that for a second. In fact, um, we actually pride ourselves on, um, on um, achieving at a very high level across a high range of things across, our, um, across all the things that we do. We base ourselves on five core pillars of academia, citizenship, the arts, technology and sport. Uh, when we did a review of how we do business across our college and revision and remission and revalued our school, uh, with all the work that we do with our local community, we found that those five core areas are what we do and do very well. And, um, and we're heavily embedded in our community and, um, and we actually see ourselves as a, as a leader in our local community here and doing great things for our students across the board. So that's a bit of context. Um, the next steps data that I've shown you there, look, I won't bore you with the data, but what we've seen of recent years is a, a growing trend of our students graduating, uh, going into health related industries. And, um, and this year, sorry, last year, 2020, um, of our students going on to university um, uh, professions, 60% of the students who graduated last year who've got an ATAR have gone into medical um, professions or, or, or studying in that particular area. So. That's a, that's a massive thing for us. And, um, and it's, uh, it's something that we want to continue to work on. Uh, in fact, our ducks yesterday that was announced, uh, Kayla, she uh, flew up from Brisbane for the day. She's studying um, paramedical at, uh, at Colvin Grove in, in Brisbane. And she's hoping to move on to UQ once she's finished that. 
part of her training. So it's a, it's a, big, it's a big thing for us. And um, all of those students on that 60% number all did the cert to and help through Connect and Grow. So that's, uh, that's a big thing for us. And we're starting to move into that area. Um, we've got, as I mentioned, a growing trend. 60% um, of our students, there's just a few photos there. Our school captains, our wonderful school captains from last year. Um, as you can see, are all going into the medical fields, the health fields, and um, all outstanding young people, and uh, and will do very, very well. Our, our alumni, our growing alumni, is starting to have a lot more students who are going into the medical fields, whether that being nursing, uh, a doctor, where one of our students is a qualified doctor as of last year, uh, and Caitlin McCracken, you can see there's a um, bachelor of dental surgery. So it, it's an area that we're, we're starting to really grow in. Where this all really came to, where we, how we got into this, and, and as I've said to Dave and others at many times, my background's in the marine industry, um, certificates in the marine, vet in the marine. So, but where this really came from was really around an opening that we saw on the southern side of Cairns here, around the opening of the Cairns Self Health Facility. Uh, that was a big push by our local member here, Curtis Pitt. Uh, go back 10 years ago exactly, we had Cyclone Yassi come into the Cairns region. Um, we had to completely evacuate our hospital as it was located directly on the foreshore of Cairns. The tidal surge was going to be about three metres predicted. Um, and, um, and Curtis has taken the opportunity to actually set up a very fant a fantastic medical facility out here in the southern corridor of Cairns out of the flood zone. Uh, that they can convert into a medical facility uh, within a 12 to 24 hour period. Um, and so, so that, that's for an emergency and that's located straight across the road from one of our cyclone shelters. But also it's um, uh, going to be used as a dialysis um, centre uh, for our southern corridor area here because that's a growing market in that area. So it's a fantastic facility. For me as a college principal looking around in our local area, what are we going to latch on to? Where are we going to steer our students? What's something that an industry that they can see in their local area um, that would give them um, give them a spark to you know improve their their academic um, performance in the college? Um, so the, the the health fell into our lap, and through a couple of conversations with fellows like Clive Scarrett, you know, who's the CEO of Canton Hinterland Hospital, Curtis Pitt, who's a very strong um, supporter of our college and wants the best for our kids and various other people, uh, PHN, uh, obviously Connect and Grow, obviously um, the Gateways to Health Industry people have been right in behind us in Desmond. Um, we've been able to grow uh, the concept and, um, and we've actually hit the ground running and doing a fantastic job. And that's a lot to do with the fellow sitting beside me here, Dan, who's um, like a dog on a bone and getting stuck into this and doing some excellent work. So as, um, as you know, we signed up last year on the 24th of August um, it's now the 24th of February and uh, we've come a long, long way in a very short period of time. We're looking at um, how we set up a governance sector for, our, for the work that we're doing here. Uh, we're looking at having some fairly big hitters in our governance of our um, program that we're setting up. So if you just flip forward to, um, so I'll just stay on here. I'll, I'll come back to governance later on. Sorry, Dan. Um, but you can see where we signed up. The next program there is that out of this, um, Curtis Pitt um, confirmed a commitment of $600,000 towards a purpose-built medical training precinct for the college. Um, this has now grown. We've had Canstruct International come on side. Uh, Canstruct International are looking at gifting us. Well, they have gifted us. Uh, we've just got to get it up here, a $250,000 purpose-built 40-foot container medical facility um, that um, can be basically lifted up put on a ship or a truck and transport it anywhere across the state or the nation or around the world um, as a standalone medical facility. They've come on board and they've gifted us to us. So by the time we finish with this setup, we'll have a million dollar medical training precinct. And it's all there to help us to actually, um, to train our students at the facility. But the advantage of PrEP to 12 is that we've got a unique opportunity here to thread health as a major pillar through our college, everything from uh, forefronting it in the student's curriculum through to the end point, which is obviously our students going into a uh, medical um, professions and training down the track. You can see Sam there. Um, Sam's doing some uh, funny things there on VR. We are one of the world, we're, well, we're one of the um, Queensland's leading virtual reality schools in the, um, 
in the fact that we actually are incorporating virtual reality and the emergent technologies into our curriculums, year seven, eight, and nine, uh, to give the students that pivot point where that, that, that unique experience that they would not experience watching a video or looking at an old textbook. Um, you know, so for instance, um, they, they, can, they can walk on the, um, on the wall of China um, or they can be involved in a World War II trench um, and get that experience, but we're transferring that into how we can use that to improve students' um, access to what health, what health actually is through virtual reality. And we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment. Uh, and we'll be releasing that soon for people to have a look at. So if you just want to go, you, that's the, this is our vision. Um, so the purpose of the program is to provide students of all ages with insight, access and connectivity to health related careers. As I mentioned, we're a P12 college. We've got a great facility located within a kilometre of us here. Um, our students can see it, uh, see the facility. Uh, it's our job to make sure that um, they know exactly what happens in a facility like that and all the possible careers that they could have. And, uh, and I've learned a lot in the last six months and there's a lot of allied health and, and careers that students can go into. And, um, and, that's, and that's where we want to go. So we've got the medical training precinct uh, so we've just got a bit of symbolism there, whether that's the final product is another story, but that's kind of where we're at, which will be built on our site. And that's to cater for our 10, 11 and 12 students who are involved in the certificate programs that we'll offer. Uh, but that's also the point there is, and we learned a lot from some of the other gateway to industry schools and health, um, Kiwana Waters, for instance, who have got over 300 students per year going through their facility. And those students are across the, the um, uh, across the Sunshine Coast. We'll be looking at doing a very similar thing here. Um, you can still remain involved in your school in Innisfail, for instance, but for one, for one morning a week, you might come up to Bentley Park College and do your, do your training at the medical training precinct because we've got the facility and we will have the staff to be able to do that. So that's the big picture a couple of years down the track. Um, we, we have, we, we've called it two things. So we've got, we're calling our program in our school here gateway to health program. We're not stealing gateway to industry schools thunder here. The symbolism for our college, as you'll notice there, if you look at the medical training precinct, the symbolism for our college is gates. Um, so Bentley Park College um, has got as our main symbol on our logo, our gates. And, um, and so we thought we would just mirror that in our gateway to health program. And that program will be prepped to 12, everything that we can do to position our students to go into a pathway in health related careers. Um, we've also just taken on a $1.8 million project around Indigenous girls, um, which we have got a very strong desire to weave health related industries all through that, um, have a big health strand, whether that be mental health, sexual health, physical health, and also the ultimate would be getting our young Indigenous girls into health related careers. And, um, and that's all about how we reduce their um, uh, any, any disciplinary absences they might have, how we improve their level of achievement, how we improve their retention from grade 10 into 12, and also the straight down the line career pathways that we're putting them into. So you can see the vision that we've got there on the floor, um, the thing I'll keep moving forward. That's a bit of a snapshot of what our medical training precinct could possibly look like. Um, Canstruct International have come on side. We've got another, we're getting right into shipping containers as a, um, as, as a training facility, we met with our Director General of Education, Peter Kelly, the other week when he came to Upper School. And one of our visions is that we will have a container, all of our virtual reality gear, uh, that will have a very strong health component uh, that we can deliver to various Cape York schools to, so that the students there can access um, virtual reality. I did 10 years in Cape York across um, lots of Indigenous communities in there. And uh, what a great learning opportunity for that. That's part of our vision down the track. Um, some people might call it pie in the sky, but we're pretty good at doing things that um, other people haven't thought of. Medical training precinct. So that's that's basically what our six hundred thousand um, dollars will be purchasing for us, and um, compliments to Curtis Pitt and the work that he's doing. Um, and that's a purpose-built facility. We learn a lot from our partner schools when we looked at Kwana Waters and the great work they're doing down there. Um, we're we're hoping to mirror. That and that's one of the great things about Gateway is that we got access to a uh, foot in the door to have a look at some other schools who are, even though we were the first signed up in the state, um, we're probably the least advanced in all of this. 
Um, so the advantage of being able to see those other schools has been out. And we, we've, we've, got, we've come so far in six months, uh, we couldn't have done that unless we had those contacts in those schools. So thanks, um, David and your team for facilitating that for us. There's a bit of a snapshot of the medical training precinct. Uh, setting up basically is two classrooms and the big middle one that you can see in there, um, that would be set up as a ward, um, as a typical ward. We'll also have the Canstruct International um, set up as well. So we'll have a magnificent training facility and we hope to use, uh, we're also a gateway to industry uh, technology school because we're high end technology and we'll pump every bit of technology into that facility that you can think of to improve our students teaching and learning. Um, last but not least, I might actually get Dan to talk to this. I've spoken very quickly over it. Uh, Dan's been heavily involved in pulling all this together. We couldn't have got this far without him. Um, so Dan, can I just get you to talk through these next couple of screens? Thank okay. you. Um, well, what we have in front of us, basically we, we're looking at those um, students doing uh, courses in the school, doing the Cert 2, uh, very similar to uh, the Mackay set up there, where we'll be doing a Cert 2 for those students to get into the industry. We already currently deliver that Cert 2 in health and community services via uh, Connect and Grow. And um, so on with their delivery uh, of that, we'll be looking at trying to progress into 2022 uh, and to start delivering the Cert 3 for that course. And then hopefully the idea with that is to then pick up those school-based traineeships and start moving those students through into the uh, into employment uh, down the line. Um, the courses obviously we just talked about are this, the Cert 2 um, and uh, with community services there and the Cert Three there. The whole idea around uh, working with our more academic students, we want to actually try and extend those students. So the Cert 3 um, here, we're actually looking at doing the Cert 3 standalone and then pushing forward and trying to take on that um, assistant in nursing. So uh, for those students that are really in this industry, this is where their, their goal is. They should be leaving Bentley Park College with that, that AIN um, ticket under their belt. Um, being the, the main goal in 2022. Um, Did you want to talk about your Oh, yeah, so, um, oh, God, the last oh. so basically uh, the last slide we have here is um, health trainees, uh, traineeships that we're looking to work with uh, in the very soon future, basically hopefully the week one, term two, um, looking at working with a Puma Pima around um, the health services. Again, that's looking at working with um, Connect and Grow. Uh, we have Queensland Health, where, as I said, that self side facility there, we're in talks with them around how we can put students through there to do some learning in um, health, uh, self, health service assistance um, and potentially down the line as well, working through um, the business, business administration. Um, wood choppering as well, looking at doing very similar type of work as traineeships. And one of the ones that's uh, quite exciting for us and uh, I, I know Bruce wants me to try and get a um, runway strip at the end of the uh, uh, school here is the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Um, we're in talks with them at the moment around um, putting on an identified position for an addiction student at the moment, and hopefully this being a pilot that we would be able to put across the state as well. Um, but uh, looking at putting a student on in business administration at the moment, and then moving forward down those lines as well. So uh, very exciting times for training opportunities on the job, and obviously um, most of us uh, kind of in this room will know it obviously hands-on learning for some of these students is, is uh, definitely a really good way of getting into the industry and ha having that base knowledge um, into the industry uh, of health. Yeah so Clive Skerritt um, at, at Hinterland Health is, uh, is a big picture man and um, and so look we, we've had great conversations with him there's, there's currently four percent of Indigenous um, workers in the um, health professions in, in far north Queensland here and he's He's got a big vision of making that around the 14% mark. Uh, we, we very much want to be very much a part of that. And, um, and you know, we because we've got a lot of students who come out of Cape York uh, or come out of the islands, um, the, the, the ultimate for us is that if we've got these students training in our college here, going down these particular pathways, when they go back to back to country, you know, over holidays or, or or um, yeah, Christmas holidays or, or our normal school holidays. Uh, we're working with trying to get those students placed within the clinics um, to do some, you know, if they've got a two week holiday, maybe they do a week. Um, if they have a six week holiday over the, um, you know, over the Christmas break, 
Uh, they might do a couple of weeks, but to try and get them paid employment back in their local community while they're on those breaks. But also if they want to return to their community, um, and look, in my, my background is the West Coast, you know, Kaunyama, Pombrao, Arakoon, Mapu, Napper and Weaver, um, is, is getting those students into those facilities, uh, into the, if they want to return home, and which some, um, most of them do, and, uh, but, also, but, but being guaranteed employment back at their home and, um, and, and, and boosting the amount of local people who actually, um, you know, in, in, the health, in the health sector in their, in their little towns out there in the Western Gulf and uh, also in the rest of Cape York and the Torres Strait. So, but yeah, that, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we, we couldn't have done this without the, um, without the, uh, the checkup and the, and the gateways to partnerships that we've got here. Um, and all the great connections that you guys have made with us and, and, and all the other, you know, the training that we've got even today has been great to hear, you know, some of the stats that we're hearing across the state, the great work happening in Mackay and, um, and where we're going with here. So, yeah, it's, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, that was a great note to finish on, the fact that you're looking at people going back home, um, students being able to go back and... and work in their local community and, and that's really what it's all about so um i'll, I'll be in cairns um mid-march so i'll i'll drop you a line and i might hopefully i'll be able to pop in because i haven't been to you i'd love to, to pop by while i'm up there okay our final presentation um today a, another major player in the health workforce space um, for many years has been health workforce queensland we've been focusing a lot today on the vet sort of level qualifications but uh, and those entry level positions, Health Workforce Queensland um, does focus more on the, the tertiary level and the medical workforce, it's fair to say. And um, while we wanna grow local workforces, sometimes we simply can't and we need to encourage um, people to, to go to re regional and rural areas. And today we have Andy Vanderich and Meredith Connor, who will tell us about their rural immersion programs. We are running a little over time, but don't cut your presentation short, Andy and Meredith. We've got most people still online. Uh, if you do have to leave, that's understandable, but uh, it's a good sign that most people are still online. So over to you, Andy and Meredith. Thank you very much. No worries, David. I'm a fast talker, so that uh, shouldn't be a problem. <clears throat> um, so yes, I'll be co-presenting with Meredith Connor. Um, just a little bit about HWQ. Um, our purpose is uh, we're focused on making sure that um, our rural and remote communities uh, in Queensland have access to highly skilled uh, health professionals. And one way for us to do that is by uh, attracting students into these communities and immerse them in uh, the rural experience. So the biggest program that we have that does that is the John Flynn placement program uh, named after this handsome fellow on the right. Um, John Flynn, you might recognize him from the $20 bill. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a program that's funded by the Department of Health um, and it has been around for quite some time. As you can see in the recycled slide, um, was started in 1997. Um, the Rural Health Workforce Agency Network is a consortium of seven workforce agencies uh, across Queensland, uh, sorry, across uh, Australia, um, run that together uh, with Health for Workforce Queensland uh, taking the lead. Um, the program is designed to attract the future medical workforce into a remote, remote and rural career. And um, each year we sign up uh, 300 new students for the program so they stay on the program for about three to four years so at any given time we have about 900 to 1200 students on the program now how does it work so each student is um, matched with a doctor in a remote or rural location and they are required to complete eight weeks uh, of placements over the three to four years um, so during the placement, the students will work alongside this mentor um, and they will also keep going back to the same mentor. So year after year, which ensures they have a really close relationship coming out of that and also really learn uh, about living in the community because um, it's not just about the placement itself. It's also about the experience of being rural. Um, so to ensure that they get a really good experience, we also pair them with a, with a host where they will be staying for the duration of their uh, placement. And if available, we will also pair them with a community contact who um, will 
you know who can inform them who can welcome them who can bring them in touch with other people and um, really enhance their experience uh, um, in the bush um, so the host and community contacts are there to give the students insight into the social and cultural aspect of living in a remote and rural community now 2020 was quite a challenging year for the program as for most programs um, but we had a lot of placements cancelled last minute due to border closures and travel restrictions we also had a, a big reduction in mentors and community hosts and contacts who were willing to to be uh, on the program and a reduction in the applications as well from students now we're not too worried about the application side of things because we uh, the program is very highly regarded and um, we have 300 places available but we have normally over a thousand to twelve hundred applications this year we had 800 so still far more than we can actually fit but um the mentors and the community hosts and contacts we are um, in desperate need of increasing those because not having those people available means we can't place everybody every year and that's uh, that's a definite loss for the program so um, the details there below uh, for our website and also for our team so please reach out if you do know if you have interest of becoming a mentor or a host or a community contact yourself or if you know someone who's willing to do that um, there are some benefits available and also you can find those on our website um, one last thing and I know this is was you know these programs are not really a grow your own model but what we did find with um COVID, we actually went from an interstate model to an intrastate model so the placements were intrastate and um what we noticed with that is that a lot of mentors were actually happy with that development because um students who come interstate to a placement in rural or remote uh, queensland are actually more likely to come back later on because they're closer to home and actually start their career there and the students themselves were also quite happy with it because they were closer to home they had access normally access to, to, to their own transportation and felt less isolated so um, all with all that's that's something that we're looking into maybe uh, doing again for the for the cohorts coming up um, and I guess last uh, the students the applications this year are gonna uh, open in May so um, yeah if you're interested in that please reach out to us um, now Meredith will talk a little bit about another uh, rural immersion program that we have but I'll start off with a really quick video on that one if that all works, let me just try to find it for you guys. Sorry. And no, I'll just um, quickly do a bit of an intro while mm -hmm. you get that going. Yep. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Meredith. I'm the Future Workforce Team Leader. So aptly named uh, Future Workforce, where, where the philosophy of Grow Your Own actually translates into tangible programs. So uh, the video that we're going to share with you now is one of those programs. It's called Grow Rural. So I'd just like you to have a look at that, and then I I'll speak to it. Uh, I've got no sound, uh, Meredith. No, I haven't either. Oh, there's a no sound, guys? Yeah, no sound. Uh, hold on. Share computer sound. Hopefully that's better. Thank you for letting me know. Is that better? Yep, yep, yep. you're good. I think the biggest thing anyone can do for themselves is exploring and actually going to rural Australia. The main reason I wanted to be part of the Grow Rural Health program was I really wanted to expand um, my thinking. Once you get here, it just absorbs you, being able to follow your clients through from birth to death, being able to see them be sick and also be part of them getting better and then seeing them down the street walking, living their normal life. It's not just a once off, you don't just see them and never find out what happens. You can see them and know their story and you're really a part of their journey. It's just really eye-opening to see how collaborative you can be and how close the community within the clinic and staff can be. That's what community is all about and that's what rural health service is all about. So that's why I just love being a rural nurse in a rural community. I wanted to be a part of the Grow Rural program because I thought it was such an amazing opportunity to be able to come out to rural communities while I'm still a student and be able to form those connections with other health professionals so that I might be able to do placements and then eventually hopefully come out and live and work in these communities. It's just an absolutely amazing experience and I'm, it's only the first year but I'm just so excited to see how much it's going to progress over the next three years. It's just going to be so exciting. Oh, sorry. No, trying to get my presentation up again. <laughs> 
So I, I think the, uh, the important uh, thing to note at this point is what David mentioned earlier is that uh, Health Workforce Queensland uh, works uh, and is funded to work in primary health care and the future workforce team works with health students uh, but at, in the university sector so we differ from some of the other programs and initiatives where uh, your your uh, their hospital programs or vet sector focused so that's where where we differ however we do share the philosophy of grow your own and I think one of the important things to say about that is that we also recognize that communities uh, uh, maybe they don't have ownership over the outcomes of Grow Your Own, but they do um, contribute to rural health outcomes nationally. And by that, I mean, you know, we can, uh, we can, uh, um, you know, advance the grow your own model, but we, we actually do not have any uh, ownership over the outcome of that. Uh, so, but Grow Rural is, being a particularly successful program for us. It started uh, in 2017. We started off with a cohort of 30 students in central Queensland. And the idea was that those, that group, same group of uh, 30 students would come together once a year for a weekend for three consecutive years. They would start in year one and finish in year three. And we would use, we were very focused on taking students uh, from all disciplines and we really wanted to foster an inter-collaborative uh, practice between students and rural health professionals. Um, and uh, we, saw GROW as an opportunity to involve communities in the actual development of the program, uh, to involve their resources that sat outside of the health professional um, area. So we brought in other community organisations. And as uh, we moved into the second year, we also involved student representatives to be part of the program development. So we saw it from a very community development um, uh, uh, perspective. And if you could jump to the next slide, that would be great. Uh, we've also, uh, last year, we started a second Grow Rural cohort in Southwest Queensland, where we, uh, uh, and they will be finishing in 2022. And this year, we're starting off a new Central Queensland cohort. So the vision is to expand, grow into uh, all the uh, rural and regional PHNs in Queensland. And the bigger vision is for it to be a national program. So essentially, it's rural immersion. Uh, it's to encourage them to obviously go back to, uh, to rural communities. Uh, and uh, they, there's a, uh, the program will take them through a series of uh, clinical uh, skill sessions, but also one of the highlights of the program for the students is that they get billeted out with uh, uh, community members uh, overnight. Um, and they also attend community events like a trivia night or uh, one community had a, uh, an event called Food of the Worlds. So there's, um, as I said, it's very important component of this is the non-clinical aspect. Thanks, Andy. So, how do we know if this works? Do we know if it works? Well, we asked each of those, uh, that first cohort, the 2017 to 29 cohort, we evaluated them every year. And then at the end of their final year, we uh, did a kind of an overall uh, evaluation and um, they, uh, fed back to us that it had been a rewarding and worthwhile experience. Uh, it's certainly, I think, you know, I don't think that what is on that slide in any shape or form conveys the amazing experience those students had. I mean, it was life changing for them. And, and we, you know, like I attended every single one of those years with those students. Uh, you know, you become like family and you, and I guess like with all family members, when they graduate, you want to know what happens next. So out of the 29 students, um, 15 of them were medical students. So they're still working through their, you know, their intern years and PGY twos, but, for the uh, nursing and allied health students, uh, we there have been three nurses have gone rural, one in Longreach, one in Cardwell, one Boyne Island. 
an OT has gone to Roma, a dietitian has just taken up a position with Gucci Healing in Mount Isa, and one of the paramedic um, students is based in Townsville. So I think out of um, the 20, actually the 29 students that started, uh, that's a, a fantastic outcome and really does speak to the value of this kind of program. And the final side. So the next step, what happens after you've been on Grow Rural, we have another program which we've called Going Rural, and that is to support our, our nursing midwifery and allied health students to go on placement because we recognise that those placements are the next step to your employment within communities. And it maintains the connections that you made. It may not necessarily be in the same um, community as your if you did a, the Grow Rural program, uh, but it is a way of uh, fostering and promoting the uh, capacity for uh, students to become employed in our rural communities. So that's called Going Rural. And uh, at, uh, I think that's probably the, a good note to end on. I'm sorry that was a bit rushed, but um, hopefully it's given you a bit of uh, an overview of the work we do at future, in Future Workforce. Thank you very much, David. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, very welcome uh, there, Meredith and Andy. Thanks so much. Uh, and will your slides be available as well? Do you think we can share those? Yes. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Okay. So, if, and if you want more information about the work of Health Workforce Queensland, you can certainly get in contact with the team there. So that concludes our presentation this morning. Um, so thank you for um, joining us. A really big thank you to our presenters today. Um, as I say, most people, vir virtually the whole group stayed online, even though we did run over. So I think that's testament to the, the level of interest. Uh, presentations were great, lots happening, uh, and really um, an exciting year ahead, I think, for everyone who's working in this space. So thanks again to everyone. Um, this uh, Queensland Primary Healthcare Network meeting is quarterly, as I say. The next one's in May, and traditionally our May meeting is on the theme of reconciliation. It's around uh, National Reconciliation Week. So we'll be in touch with you. If you registered for this event, we'll tell you what the, um, the exact details of, of the next event in May. So thanks, everyone. Have a great morning, and hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks, David.